further on rye and that northern, they just bought enough ground in northern Florida to run as many cows as they do south of Orlando, which is largely going to be a heifer facility that will be all forage based. So the work that we've done, we've been able to, or we've demonstrated that we can decrease development costs in some of these extensive systems by over $100 a head. We've taken a di uh, different approach to the heifer enterprise that they're a stalker system that all of them are exposed for a short period of time, and then those that don't get pregnant are actually profitable. There's thousands of yearling heifers roaming the sand hills that are never intended to breed. And if you're ever gonna have a beef female that, that comes up non-pregnant, it better be one that never got pregnant in the first place. And some of the work that we've done with uh, utilizing a short breeding season, challenging those females early in life it makes an animal that's more adapted, more adapted to that environment that she's going to be run on, expected to be run on as a cow. And we do see lighter, lighter weights, lighter mature weights, at least up to five years of age. And I think there are some concerns with some of our later breeding seasons. We have a March herd and a May herd, and I'll show you a little bit of data. Our May herd reproductive rate is a full 20 to 30% lower than the ones that are bred to calf in March due to declining forage availability. So I, I say that a lot of people, I mean, we take pride. We're good stewards of the land and of our cattle and, and uh, how many of would be proud to show your neighbor these heifers? These are standing at NDSU for us in the middle of the winter where I put our, our uh, individual feeding facility in. You know, you got a visitor coming down the driveway seeing these heifers, you, you're going to have them out there where everyone can see. How about these? Well, they're the same heifer. And that compensatory gain thing that the yearling industry largely uh, takes advantage of also works in heifers. So these heifers get to some similar uh, recommended body weight by calving, but a lot of it is, is done with compensatory gain, and I would argue Learn behavior. Those are grazing animals that, are, that know how to forage. So I tell people, even if you're not comfortable with 50, 55% of mature weight, just do the math. With today's genetics, we're weaning a five weight heifer and a May 1 breeding is pretty early for us and probably for a lot of you. We got a long time to get there and a heifer never has to gain over a pound and a half a day, even to get to some target weight that exceeds what she needs to be at. So a lot of the work after this target weight was uh, established back 40 years ago that they had to be two thirds of mature weight was done looking at patterns of gain to get there. And Don Clanton was a nutritionist at North Platte before I was there. He found no difference in age of puberty conception rate or calf performance. And some work out of Kansas actually showed this even gain versus the late gain. The late gain, they did it with 12% less feed, and they had a heifer that had greater first service conception rate. So that flushing effect that you guys taught me was only in sheep also occurs in heifers. It doesn't in increase twinning rate, but it, that change in nutrition actually moving into breeding had a positive effect on the percent that uh, got pregnant early and they had greater longevity. This is just the effect of initial breeding season development. Those heifers developed on this low high, there were more rounds still at five years of age. And the low high tells me what, they were either restricted quantity or quality of feed stuff. And turns out this is in quality. All the work we've done, we've never restricted quantity. Instead of locking a heifer up and feeding her $3 corn and corn silage, distillers, grains, alfalfa, hay, and getting them all pregnant and saying, oh, by the way, you're never going to see that again. Treat them like cows. So I made the comment about time of conception. A great resource in Nebraska, the Meat Animal Research Center runs about 8,000 cows, and largely you don't hear about them, do you? They've done a lot of great work. A lot of your genomics work that you guys are utilizing comes out of there. Bob Cushman put together some 15,000 records of when 
heifers conceive their first time and looked at longevity and a heifer that conceived in her first cycle her first time had greater longevity and by the time she weaned her six calves she weaned another calf for you so that event so if you not everything to do with when an animal conceives is accounted for by age so i guess the approach we take is expose these females for a short period of time and only keep the ones that conceive in the first cycle and then whatever your other marketing options are dictates how long your breeding season is i would argue a pregnant animal pregnant any time is worth more than an open so here's some work we've done developing heifers on corn stalks and in a dry lot. And these would probably be like for some people's standards, even developed in a dry lot. We do this uh, pre-breeding treatment, we generally have heifers on stalks, winter grass, or in a dry lot at some rate of gain. And then we lock them all up together, feed them MGA in the same pan, syn uh, synchronize them, and breed them, which do you think had the higher pregnancy rate, the lighter or the heavier heifers? I wish we could repeat that. If I take the four years of data, you know, by accident, one year we got 86% AI pregnancy rate. Is that realistic? Will you ever repeat that? Unless you turn your bulls out the day after your AI, right? That kind of helps. But those lighter heifers bred better. And that leads to what I talked about earlier, why did they? Why did they breed better? So here's gain, the blue bar during the winter is on corn residue, the other's on the dry lot. So we weren't pushing those heifers hard, even locked up. And then we AI'd them and we turned them out in the same pasture and I brought them back in about 40 to 50 days later to ultrasound to distinguish between the AI and the bull breads. And those heifers that were previously on corn residue outgained the heifers in the dry lot by a pound a day and they were grazing side by side. So why? Is it compensatory gain? Some, but I would argue there's some behavioral component that those animals were only ever locked up for a very short period in their life, and for lack of a better term, they were better grazers. They utilized that environment differently than ones that were confined. So this post-breeding has just as much post-breeding management or we weren't managing these different, that's the thing. They were managed different pre-breeding, but they saw that post-breeding environment differently. Had a huge effect on, on reproduction. So a word of caution here, some work uh, Cliff Lamb did when he was in Minnesota, made heifers either condition score seven or five, restricted them until they quit cycling and then refed them. And those fat heifers had to get a full condition score greater to start cycling. So we, can we program females by how we develop them to be dependent on a certain amount of body fat to ever breed? I think that's, there's certainly some hormones that would, that would suggest that. So you all as seed stock breeders do a terrible job of touting half the benefit of an AI program, which is what? Synchronization. You know you can synchronize even with natural service. How many do? We've done this for John Patterson here. Thank you for the support in the back. <clears throat> this is very simple. We turn the bulls out, five days later, everything gets a shot across the land. We've done this since I started at Nebraska. And we did this at Miles City. And in three different calving herds, Bob Short was heading this up in a short breeding season, had greater than 85% preg rate in a 32 day breeding season. And that affords or allows those cattle uh, another opportunity to, to uh, conceive in a short period. So those calves that are products of a synchronization program are heavier, they're older and heavier at weaning. And we shortened our breeding season from 60 to 45 days in one year and did we hurt preg rates. Synchronized on the right, <clears throat> not left they were the same and we increased uh, profitability by 35 bucks a head 
So Harley Hughes also said opportunities uh, and increasing profits in a beef enterprise is in moving late calving females up. They give some goals there that I don't think are good enough. Can we move a late calver up? So here's some work out of Missouri. With 2,340 first calf heifers, they were all about half were cycling, half were not. Synchronized, time bred, which had the higher preg rates. They're the same. How can that be? I was giving a talk in, in Springfield or Joplin a year ago, and I had a guy so mad he was gonna go strangle his bed. And I said, well, well, wait a minute. He said, he tells me anything that's high risk of not cycling, he doesn't want me to synchronize and breed. Well, those are the ones that likely have the biggest payoff. How do you suppose these were synchronized? Yeah, right there. So that thing, I moved, I moved a late cabin cow up 56 days in one year. And routinely now I have ranchers that will take whatever cutoff they pick of calving and take that group of females, they'll put cedars in them for a week, pull them, give prostaglandin, and turn them with the bulls, and they're sending me calving records from one year to the next, and they're routinely moving them up at least a cycle, if not two. <laughs> There's other progesterone-containing devices around the world. Where do you think this one's from? Say it. Yeah, Australia. So they, Pfizer at the time when I was over there had both the Q-Mate and the Cedar and they didn't know what to, the government said, no, you got to give one of them up. They sold this to BioNation Bears Marketing and rumor is it's going to come to the United States. Is it better than the Cedar? No. There's a PRID in Canada that uh, is a progesterone containing device. Apparently the Cedar's off patent, but I've not seen any other products. So what are some of these things that influence when animals conceive or if they conceive at all. This is a big study that was done when the cedar came out to look at different protocols and across 14 states, this was the variation that people saw. Here's what we're dealing with. Fertilization rate in most mammals is really high, approaching mid 90%, but we lose 30 to 40% of the embryos before day 40. Cost the beef industry millions of dollars a year. And can we do it? Have we done any progress, made any progress in this event? Not a lot. So what are some of the things that influence that? Genetics is one. When we uh, started collecting carcass data, we started use it as, using it as a selection calling tool. Robbie Pritchard to the south of the all at Brookings he said uh, one of the biggest oxymorons in the beef industry is to call the mother of a yield grade four calf. And why would you say that? He said that calf probably was born early, went to the feed yard, grew like crazy, never got sick, and had to wait for a bunch of chronics to catch up with them before they had a semi-load to go to the packing plant. And he said, I sure don't want any of that in my herd. I was at the West Virginia Cattlemen's uh, meeting a few years ago, and <clears throat> they're great marketers. They got small groups of cattle, they put them together, get them live, send them to feed yards, sometimes retain ownership, sometimes not. They said, we're going to Nebraska, we're going to this feed yard and we're collecting, we're gonna get carcass data in our cattle. They said, we can do with this carcass data. Oh, we just think it's real important in selection and those things. I said, one of the biggest factors that influence carcass data is what? The economic conditions at the time of feeding, especially if you don't own those cattle. How happy do you think they would have been three, four years ago when we had these expensive feeder cattle that they were sending cattle to Aberdeen that weighed 14, 1500 pounds and a good Nebraska feeder was buying them and putting them back on feeding in Nebraska and making monsters out of them. What do you think about a bunch of yield grade fives? That was the economic signal to make them big. And Tom and I were just talking about that plant in Dakota City apparently can kill monsters. I had a bunch of limousine cattle at North Platte that Wolf sent me on a project and they sent them to me weighing 14 and we made them 18. And they wanted to send them to Dakota City. And we had a packing plant in Lax 60 miles away. I said, at some point this is going to be a, an animal welfare issue. 
So when we talk about reproductive success, and I mentioned this early on, this is never included. What is happening in our industry for genetic selection of traits and how does it impact the most important trait to a beef producer? We don't talk about genetics and Spangler and Marty can address this better, but uh, I just thought this needs to be included. And we talked about this last night. That one female on a commercial herd doesn't influence your genetic trend very much, right? It comes from the sire, from the sire side. And I would encourage you all, there's two talks that I really encourage you to go to from Manhattan. One is Bob Weber on heifer selection and the other is Marty Roth and Dan Larson gave the talk, one of my former students, about over, over utilization of nutrients in the seed, seed stock industry, to put it nicely. Don't make fat bowls. So reproductive traits tend to be lowly heritable as we are able to measure them. And largely, there's probably a lot of genes involved in producing not only a pregnancy, but a live calf weaned every year, right? So one of the things I talk about in my proceedings paper is, looks like three things really in genetic selection has a, have a big payout on breeding. One is dystocia. It's probably why we breed a lot of heifers to Cavanese bulls, is if they don't experience dystocia, they breed back sooner. And when we pull calves, this is some work out of Miles City that Bellows did, and providing assistance early when needed, had a positive effect on fall pregnancy when those animals returned to estrus and had an effect on weaning weights. Interesting. A calf probably taken out of that stressful environment, got up and immunized himself sooner. Suckled, never got sick in his life. Scrotal, this is, so given an EPD, what's the challenge? Make it bigger, right? Every, every trait that we select for has a threshold. And I think this is one we're realizing maybe we got enough. Because here's what's happened, right? So we're making scrotal bigger. I heard somebody in Manhattan touting that this relationship was magnificent, that these bulls with larger scrotal have daughters that reach puberty sooner. Well, I got ranches that can't leave bulls in with their cow herd more than 45, 50 days because their heifer calves start becoming pregnant. That's a problem, right? This was number two, for limited resource environment, too much milk will not always and probably is antagonistic to profitability. And those high milk and cows, we think about when we wean the calf, that, that drain or that cost goes away, it doesn't. Those high milk production potential cows have higher maintenance requirements as data from Meat Animal Research Center has shown. And then mature size. You know, the feeders, and I heard it, I heard it, don't listen to extension. We need big cattle. Well, hopefully I'll show you with some of our, our data here. You can have a moderate cow that produces a pretty acceptable feeder animal through heterosis and breed complementarity. So we have moderate cattle, and I'll, I'll show you some of our uh, end product data here in a second. But, can you select for females that excel in growth early, would produce a brother that's going to grow very well in a feedlot, but still have a moderate size? Yeah, we have tools to do that, don't we? Are we paying attention to the antagonisms and, and things that create these big cattle to make big feeder cattle? Don't know. Some are, some are. But this is what's happened, right? So I was at uh, BIF and Houston, and Larry Cundiff gave a talk about a breed that has become the epitome of a terminal animal. And what, what breed was he talking about? So, largest carcass weight, most marbling, quality grade, most yield grade fours. So they made an animal that looks a lot like some, a lot of black and white cattle that were fed in Nebraska with high feeder, feeder prices. Those cattle get enormous, but does their muscling change? We still have compositional differences within breeds, right? But we made them all the same size at slaughter. 
So that, that to me is the challenge. Where do we select these animals that fit the commercial industry? And this is Jim McGran. <clears throat> While Andy Roberts put the top part together, he said if a producer was using Angus bulls with average EBDs for milk, lean weight, yearling weight in 98 to 2000 today, they would rank in the bottom 5%. And McGrann said the reproductive rate of the cow herd has not increased in the past 20 years and has tended to decline in the past 10. <laughs> Why? Guess another thing. Morbidity in the feedlot has changed. And I tell the pharmaceutical companies, you made us products that we can, that you package in indestructible containers because we'd have to take out a bank note if, if we ever drop it. We got better ways to treat them, but we have no better morbidity rate in the feedlot. Part of that's due to selection for a lot of performance in these cattle, but I would argue part of it's due to how we've created these curve bender bulls. How have we done that? Catholic, I mean, you just heard that birth weight and post weaning growth are antagonistic. How do you make a Cavanese high growth bull? Well, one way is to shorten gestation. And we're, we're essentially done calving by due date anymore in some of these cattle. And how much of that is influenced? The calves don't look premature, but is, are their lungs fully developed? Is their immune system fully developed? And how much of that is realized later in life when they're challenged in the feedlot? I don't know. We had a summit on this issue a few years ago at NCBA. And here's this one, and I'm just as confused as anybody, so the tough questions go to Spangler if he ever wakes up. I don't know if he's here yet or not. Please give him a bad time later today. But. So this is important, right? If we're going to select for traits that have a high payout, better be ones that have a high cost to our industry. And feed's number one. Any phase, right? So it's important, it's just I don't understand it. And my genetics friends haven't explained it well enough to me. In a feedlot animal, it's simple. It's dilution of maintenance, right? Once, why do you keep feeding in front of feedlot cattle 24 hours? Because once you get to maintenance, adding that incremental gain is cheap. When have we measured gain on a mature cow? How does that data collected in the feedlot or in a bull test translate to my cows grazing in the sand hills that I want to be able to eat a lot, that I want to be able to put some fat on so I don't have to feed them all winter. I don't know, but if we're gonna look at efficiency <clears throat> in a cow herd, it better include reproductive rate. So it's an interaction of nutrient demand and supply, and the metric needs to be in something per calf exposed that translates reproduction if I'm gonna consider this trait. What's an efficient steer look like? Doesn't eat much, gains like crazy, and doesn't get fat. Probably gets fat intramuscularly. Do I want my replacement heifers to be able to put on fat in my cow herd? I think there's some antagonisms we don't understand. So Larry Cora, he says, Bunston, he says, I will I we never saw the day that you're gonna be speaking the National Angus Association Convention in Fort Worth. They said it would probably be a one and only deal. <laughs> so he said, thus, as we strive to improve growth rate, he's from North Dakota, Greg, right? Thus, as we strive to improve growth rate in the cattle industry and to make commercial cow more efficient from the standpoint of utilizing nutrients, we must ensure that we do not deviate from the goal of maintaining an optimum level of beef beef production. We gotta have that live animal, or I don't care if it's a CAB, right? And we've ignored some technologies that allow for improved or increased performance without increasing nutrient demand in our system, like implants. How many of your commercial guys use implants in your milk? You know, it's gone down. The Superior stuff says it's gone down. The North Dakota survey said it's gone down. I was with a group of ranchers in Bowman, and uh, we were visiting, and I said, how many of you guys still in your cows? They said, well, we, it probably works. Well, we know it works. But they said some comment about, we don't know if the consumer wants it. I said, what? 
They said 98% of the beef in the, in the food chain in the United States comes from an implant in Africa. Just because our cow-calf guys quit taking advantage of that technology doesn't mean that 99% of the cattle in Nebraska feed yards are going to be implanted. So I mentioned this, this time of calving, we've done a lot of work at Goodmanson and we don't have all the answers. I've written a review on choosing a calving date if anybody's interested. This is 2012 in the drought. We had as high weaning weights as ever, as high of uh, preg rates as ever, if we didn't run out of grass. The, the uh, effects of drought are often seen after the drought. So we've done some work with different calving times. These are all with running age cows. We can essentially get them pregnant anytime. But these younger females, these are March born and these are May born, were full 20 to 30% lower prey rate. Same genetics, same bull battery, why? And our first calvers are suffering. And I think it's, a, it's not a lack of forage quantity, but those young females can't physically eat enough to meet their requirements. And we're looking at potential interventions to, to overcome that. So here's 750 cows on a pivot south of the North Platte. This guy runs about 4,000 cows. And one thing you see, you don't see, is what's with them. You don't wean those calves until they come off stalks. So only does it with running H cows, supplements them, and I've got other ranches that are starting to do this too. This is the cheapest way, he says, we can background cows, or calves. Leave them on their mother and just supplement them as a group. I don't have another group to manage. And finally believes what we've demonstrated, that those heifers that come from cows that are actually left on longer actually have greater fertility. Won't do it with the young cow, I wouldn't recommend it. So there's a lot of, lot of things we have to, you have to consider as animal breeders. All these different traits, and it's just a small, small selection of them. But my challenge or question is, how does selecting for some of these post-weaning traits affect what's keeping us in business? Because we want a cow that will exist on nothing, produce a calf on nothing, that then goes to a feed yard in Nebraska and give it all the feed it can eat and expect it to not be a yield grade four when we're not getting ahead. Any challenges, antagonisms in our beefs? Can you write a plan that everybody agrees on for genetic tools selection? I can't, but that's number one. I haven't seen any of these roaming in the sand hills, but we drove by a bunch of hot wire that I know there were furry bison on Turner's ranches last week. We forgot about this one. There was a white paper written on why you don't need to crossbreed. Well, they left the chapter out of why you need to crossbreed. It's due to that crossbred cow will produce you two more calves in her lifetime. And it's a hundred dollars more profitable every year. Patsy Houghton's weaned, or not weaned, but developed her hundred some thousand heifer down in Heartland, and she says, and over, now it's higher, they see an eight to 10% increase in these hybrid females. This is why I don't hunt with John Patterson. <laughs> but he taught me that it's a balance. If we have too much protein and not enough energy, we can have issues. Fat's not the answer. It's not the whole answer. It's not a cure-all for other ails that for reproduction. I've written a review paper on the effects of fat on reproduction. Minerals can be a challenge, especially y'all west of here, right? In the oil patch where you have antagonisms and those things. And if I'm gonna feed a supplement, probably gonna put an eye on it for it. Due to the efficiency of, of forage digestibility, but also some data indicating a positive effect on reproduction. So everything has to be balanced, right? And understand what things might also be in the water. But we have these four categories of embryonic loss. Jackie, you said this is recorded, so I suppose I better behave, huh? I was at a meeting in Northwest Kansas, Northeast Kansas, and a certain breed association come in and said, we can handle these genetic defects. We got DNA tests, we got tests 
that we can breed around these. Uh, okay, no, so nobody, I'm, I'm not an animal breeder, but nobody is ever going to say why we have these curly calves or bond calves that I saw in Australia. Can we overcome this overnight if we quit inbreeding? Isn't what line breeding is inbreeding when it works or something like that? I, I don't know, but <clears throat> so there's environmental things. We're, we're not going to see a lot of these genetic defects, right? Because they result in what? Embryonic death. Yeah, it's not going to be a DD calf or a curly calf. And there's other things that we talked about in some uh, miscellaneous things that aren't a problem in beef yet, like progesterone, which is in dairy. But as we continually increase milk, it may be that we're going to have to supplement progesterone to these animals to maintain pregnancy. I don't know. You all know what that is a picture of. How many have a childhood picture going back that far? We all were one, right? It's pretty remarkable. Okay, to finish up, uh, I was taught, probably at NDSU, that one of the best indicators of when an animal would breed back is body condition. And yeah, it's important, but it's not absolute. So some work done at Goodmanson, and Greg did his PhD there, was done with time of weaning and supplementation. Do I need to supplement these cows? That's what they got. They got fresh air and what grass they could find and water. These did, the yellow line. The red line were supplemented. So you look at the bottom point around April was the time of calving and then breeding was when? Into June. So which had the higher prey grade? 14 years of data, we see no benefit of supplementing a cow grazing corn residue or winter grass in our March calving system the reason that we choose to supplement, right? But with the systems work, we haven't stopped there. We found that those heifers from non-supplemented cows, at least on winter grass, have lower pregnancy rates. That those steers, those are out of 1,200 pound cows. Our calf beds finish 13 and a quarter to 1350. I'm bringing yearlings from our May herd down to North Platte next week that weigh 960 off grass. They're gonna be 17, 1800 pounds when we, when we send them to slaughter. I bred half of our cow, or a part smaller cow herd to a terminal Simangus bull. You've all seen some Oklahoma data that shows genetic trends going up, but phenotypes haven't changed. Guess how much I increased carcass weight one year? Carcass weight, 100 pounds. 135 pounds of weaning weight, five pounds of birth. The tools are there. You all have the tools, right? But there's not, that's, and so that's live weight, carcass weight of our calf beds. So 1,300, 150 pounds heavier than a cow is, <clears throat> but we took 70 pounds per bowl, and then what's, what's the rule of thumb in a, in a yearling, that bull's age, in months for that many heifers. Didn't sell, didn't sell any bulls there, Wade, so sorry. <laughs> Betsy, just a second. What have you seen causes the anastrus in, in cattle or heifers that they're not cycling? Is there any medical, nutritional thing that's causing them not to cycle? So not cycling and breeding females, there's a lot of things. Nutrition is probably number one. Okay. Postpartum interval, they have to get to a certain period. We can move that up. Um, yeah, but nutrition, it's management. You know, lowly heritable traits tends to be respond to. And you don't feel of, it's, uh, has anything to do with the um, protocol drugs we're giving them, you know, I've heard some people say you're giving them all these drugs. And it's the same drugs they're, they they're re releasing right. naturally to, right. in the cycle, so no. Okay. And, and here's another one. People say, well, we synchronize and breed these animals, and then we get a, we get a boy with the calf bunch, and then they miss, and then start calving again. Well, guess what? Why did they miss? Because they were pregnant. Yeah, and they lost them. Ready? 
Rick, this question is kind of following up with what Luke asked. Uh, when you put up the chart about synchronization in a natural breeding group, you did put one protocol example up, but you also talked about the advantages of using a cedar to jumpstart cattle. What would be your recommendation of a protocol for synchronizing with a natural breeding uh, herd side group using a cedar? Just seven day cedar, no generics up front, cedar in, out seven days, cross the gland and turn with the bulls. Yeah, if they're not cycling, that protocol I put up will be less successful. Now is it zero? Uh, we can talk later, but I think that synchrony effect, I don't think, and I don't have the data yet, but I don't think we have to synchronize the entire herd to get the synchrony effect. Now we'll go back to some of our Nally's work with bull exposure and these androgenized cows having a stimulatory pheromone effect. But I don't know what that is, so today I recommend all. In a heifer, probably cycling, turn the bulls in five days later, cross the gland. And you can do some variations of this. Rex Ranch, they bred two mobs of 900 heifers this year, put estrotech patches on them, turn the bulls out, seven days later, pulled them in, peeled off the ones that were rubbed, and gave prostaglandin to the rest, and then they eyed them. And then turned bulls back, they had a 10 day breeding season. That's Chip, as he calls it, a hotel in Kansas. We don't need very many bred heifers like we used to. talk about the uh, how breeding uh, only keeping the heifers that get bred early um, is beneficial and I understand that from a commercial standpoint because it affects the, that individual cow's life um, but as far as making genetic progress on reproductive traits when reproductive is globally heritable how, how can we use that can we use that system to make progress on reproductive. It seems to me you'd be selecting for the economic relevant trait, am I right? Reproduction by selecting animals that got pregnant early. Yeah, I think, I think that's how you make the progress. You take the ones, and Dan, and we've had this discussion, how does those things influence those sires? When they were born, and and uh, their age, and how does that carry on for fertility too? It, it isn't, it, we know it isn't the females, and the same genes control reproduction in the males. I'd like to, I'd actually like to speak to, to that too and add, add to what Rick said. So, so you brought up a, a good kind of a, an angle. You, you pointed out that a trait like that is low inherent. And obviously with lowly heritable traits, if we're making what we call mass selection or phenotypic selection, it's not going to make a lot of progress. But what do we have, what do we have as sea stock breeders that, that can help us go beyond just straight phenotypic selection? EPDs. So with a lowly heritable trait, EPDs. You know, when it comes to highly heritable traits like, like frame score, I mean, you can make a lot of progress just eyeing cattle up. If you want to make them small, you can do that pretty fast. If you want to make them big, you can do that fast. But a trait that's slowly heritable, the EPDs are absolutely critical. Now, most, most commercial guys don't have EPDs, but they have, they buy bulls that have EPDs. So that's a critical. Well, that's an area that, uh, so, so there is heifer pregnancy that exists in the industry, um, and stability is a mass measure of reproductive function and probably many other things. So we, we, we have the tool, or the, the traits are there, can't say in all cases that the, the data are available for making decisions, but you really need to use EPDs.
have a question in regards to how efficiency. So we're, in our bridge program, we're really working on maintaining lower um, milky cows and a moderate frame score. But we're also, going, I'm trying to push a little bit of performance on getting cows that are moderate frame score, but we're beginning to pack quite a bit of weight on that frame, but maintaining moderate milk. How does that affect efficiency in the long run? So the more output, I mean, they're going to require more nutrients. I think a lot of the genetics guys, let's make the moderate cow that fits the environment and use sire selection to select the market. That's where you make the efficiency. But the, then you don't hurt the, yeah. we got a lot of smaller cows, but that doesn't mean they're lighter. You're talking about you want to keep your heifers that are bred early in the cycle, and through cedars and things like that, you're actually going to manipulate some of those infertile heifers to leap to the front. Aren't you skewing that front end by using the sinks? That's a good question. With the heifers, I don't recommend the cedar unless we're going to AI them to get them tight or MGA. But with with the prostaglandin, we're basically just we're actually if we just went in and mass gave that shot, we would actually penalize the ones that are cycling because they wouldn't respond. That just ovulated. So yeah, I understand your question. So heifer, we're gonna do a natural service, probably don't recommend a cedar, but once you got her pregnant, you're, you're locked in. She's now a huge liability if she doesn't breed. But I would argue too that it's a lowly heritable trait, and if we can somehow manipulate them to get pregnant, we reread all our opens. And people say, well, aren't you perpetuating infertility? Well, she's probably open because she was younger, immature. And guys that are buying them, they say once they're bred, they're fine. So a lowly heritable trait, those interventions likely are not going to long term genetically have a huge impact. It's talking like an animal breeder. You have three EVDs of maintenance, stability, and heifer, heifer pregnancy rate, which would say is the most important, or is that maintenance EPD, an important EPD? Is that something you should watch? So that's a spangler question for this afternoon. I don't pretend to be an animal breeder, but they sound like it sometimes. I don't know which is most important way. So in our, in, in our indexes, you know, we can actually answer that objectively. Of those three traits you just mentioned, stability is roughly twice as important in relative value uh, to the other traits you mentioned. It, it really, um, and when you think about it, I mean, it, it, it measures essentially the length of productive life of a cow, and we know, and it's made up of fertility and, and feet and legs and udder and anything you call a cow on. But we know and have for a long time that the length of time a cow can stay in the herd is very predictive of, of that cow's profitability. Right, I think um, I love the questions, love it. Uh, if you have more questions, grab Rick, but in the interest in time, let's give Rick another applause.